annual Historic Naval Ships Association Conference. That starts later tonight, so we had some free time, and we decided to stop by the Pacific Fleet Submarine Museum, which is the home of USS Bowfin, right here behind me, the Pearl Harbor Avenger. December 7th, 1942, the United States as a nation made a really big deal out of launching or commissioning or laying down as many ships as possible on the anniversary of the attack on Pearl Harbor, on the first anniversary. New Jersey, of course, has a connection to this because she is launched on that date. Submarine Bofin, the Pearl Harbor Avenger herself, was commissioned on that date. Uh, and so you see dozens and dozens of U.S. Navy warships that have December 7th as one of the important dates on their, uh, uh, their, their sheets, their commissioning or their launching dates or something like that. And that was a big national effort to prove how invested we are in this war and in changing Pearl Harbor. Of course, also here in Pearl Harbor, you've got the Arizona Memorial behind us. And you might be able to see just above the Arizona Memorial, there's a red and white striped uh, tower. That is where the Pacific Aviation Museum is, which I highly recommend visiting if you're here and on uh, Ford Island. And then, of course, just after that is our sister ship, USS Missouri, the Iowa-class battleship on which the Japanese surrender was signed. And she is moored right here in Pearl Harbor on Battleship Row, facing bow to bow with the wreck of USS Arizona and the memorial there. So. Uh, while we're here, we found a really cool artifact. Now, I'm far from an expert on submarine things, but we happened to find an expert here to help us talk about this Japanese K-10. Hello. <laughs> I'm another artifact on display. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, what we have here behind us is, is a K-10 man torpedo as uh, one of the Japanese suicide weapons desperation from the end of the Second World War. So much like the kamikazes were aircraft, you know, loaded up with bombs and then just flown into ships as they could, the Kai-10 is kind of a next generation beyond that. It's often called a manned torpedo, which in some ways it is, uh, but one of the things you probably noticed on the walk over is that it is considerably larger than your average torpedo. I mean, yeah, here's a couple of uh, torpedoes for scale. So uh, all 21 inch diameter. Yeah, and uh, I mean, fair enough, the long lance is a 24 inch, but this is considerably larger than that. Um, so this doesn't fit a torpedo tube. Do you know where it's carried on a submarine, how it's launched? Yeah, so they, they actually had to specially modify the submarines to have launch rails usually mounted aft of the conning tower. Um, they also modified the number of surface ships to launch these. So uh, the rather infamous Kitakami with its infinite numbers of torpedo <laughs> launches um, later on in the war was actually modified. They took a bunch of the torpedo launchers off the back and put some Kai-10 in the racks instead. Um, and the idea of this, this is basically the naval equivalent of the Cherry Blossom Kamikaze missile. So rather than just being you know, a, a plane that they strapped the bomb to, the Cherry Blossom was a purpose-designed Kamikaze missile. And again, this is a purpose-designed underwater kamikaze. So what it is actually at its core is still a long lance torpedo. Um, except they figured that you know a, a torpedo is already pretty packed, pretty full of everything. There's no space in there, um, certainly not enough space for a person and all the life support equipment they need because okay, they're not going to live too long, but they need to live long enough to actually guide the thing and to see out of it. And so when they started the development program, types. Uh, about three main types were actually produced in a bunch of prototypes. But they started off with the core of a long lance torpedo and then they just started adding bits to it. So they had because they had to add first a section for the person who's actually going to go in there and the control so they could actually guide it. Uh, and then once they've done that they realised well this has added weight and added drag so it needs more fuel uh, and if you want it to go on long range that needs even more fuel then you have to enlarge the bearing so that it's all running nice and hydrodynamically and then once they've done that they thought oh well you know since this is going to be a one-shot weapon it's fairly expensive compared to the average torpedo um, we want it to be definitely lethal so they packed massively more explosive in there as well mm -hmm. um, so I mean a, a long launch warhead was already pretty nasty 
um, where it, but most torpedo warheads are measured in like the hundreds of pounds. This yeah. thing has a warhead measured in the thousands of pounds. So if one of these hit, it's, it's got more than enough explosive to actually pretty much overwhelm any torpedo defense system in existence. Uh, and it probably would sink pretty much anything it hit that wasn't a carrier or a battleship. And even then, depending on where it hit, it might even do that. Um, the problems they ran into is that it turns out that it's actually very difficult to guide one of these things because there's obviously there's no compact sonar for them to use mm -hmm. um, and so you have to either use a periscope or come up right to the surface which makes you easy to spot and also means you can be shot which is what happened to a lot of Kai-10 um, and because of its core it's still a long launch drive system it's now propelling much 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 more mass so they're nowhere near as fast as a long lance either so they're they're kind of the, in some ways although they're very lethal in, if they hit you and they can theoretically track you down they're tracking you down very slowly relatively speaking and they're tracking you down from a position where if they're spotted you can actually just blow them out more with the ship with the ship's guns and of course we're talking late war u.s um, surface vessels so they've got a lot of guns <laughs> um, and even even a 40 millimeter boat would quite happily do enough damage to, to stop one of these things and so there is a, quite a lot of um, difference in the records because in Japanese records they actually launched a reasonable number of Kaiten and they, you know, they they'd launch and everyone would listen and then sooner or later there'd be a massive explosion and they logically conclude, right, he must have hit his target, and that target's almost certainly going to be dead, but that's not certain to check it out, let's leave. And so they chalked it up, kill, and it turned out that actually most of them had either missed their targets, gotten not lost, and then just detonated, or they'd been blown up on their way in. So actually very, very, very few of these ships were actually hit by Kai-10 in the end. So they turned out to be a bit of a waste of time albeit that there were an awful lot of them in storage in 1945 ready for what could have been Operation Downward invasion of the Japanese home islands, um, at which point they could have had a fairly nasty impact, but I suspect it would have been more by just sheer weight of numbers than anything else, plus um, in the run-up, although they were also attacking landing areas and so forth, most of the targets that the Japanese subs were coming across were active US Navy warships, which are somewhat more difficult to target than landing craft. Right. Whereas if it had been, you know, the invasion of the Japanese home islands, it could have been LSTs and other things that are slow moving, don't have as much defensive weaponry, and obviously have a pack full of men. So it could have been nasty. Fortunately, that never, we never had to see how that came to pass. Um, so in the time we've been hanging out here, a lot of people walking by have said, oh, it's a midget sub. Uh, midget sub is quite famously used here at Pearl Harbor. How does this compare to one of those? Number of crew, weapon systems, that sort of thing. So a, a midget sub's crew, depending on which ones you're looking at, whether the German ones, Japanese ones, British ones, etc., they're usually in the region of three to six people. Kai-10 is a one-man unit, okay. so either is the And of course, um, again, depending on the sub, most midget submarines either carry a couple of torpedoes themselves to launch, which is the ones in Pearl Harbor had a couple aboard, um, or in the case of the British X-Craft, they just have a pair of massive Amatol-filled saddle charges that they just drop off and run away on the timer. Um, whereas this thing is, it is the weapon. Um, and it's just massive load of explosive up front and, and runs into it. Ironically enough, it's not actually too far off the size of a lot of midget mm -hmm. subs. And in fact, the earliest versions of the X-Craft, although they might slightly outmass a Kai-10, they're actually shorter. Because there's an XE-class X-Craft preserved in Chatham Dockyard. Mm -hmm. And the XE is a slightly larger version of the X-Craft that was designed for the Pacific War. And that is actually slightly shorter than this Kai-10. Uh, it's just a little bit taller vertically because, again, being a sub, it's got ballast tanks and so forth. Uh, whereas this is... Yeah, an overgrown torpedo with a person in it. <laughs> yeah. We have a question from the crowd mm -hmm. that's slightly unrelated. Uh, who won the Naval Treaty? The Brits and the Americans? The Washington Naval Treaty, I'm guessing they mean. Uh, they were not specific. I'll let you talk yeah. about it. Uh, do we both agree that Great Britain won that one? Um, I think it depends which category of ships you're looking at. Okay, okay. Because um, I think if you're looking at aircraft carriers, 
the Americans definitely won the Naval Treaty because they managed to finagle Lexington and Saratoga out of it. Um, in terms of cruisers, America definitely won that one um, because they managed to get they managed to argue for equal equal parity with the British, which was great because the Americans were looking mainly at a concentrated fleet. The British were looking at having to have a concentrated fleet and a distributed fleet. Um, yeah, Great Britain neither got the size that they wanted nor the number that they exactly. wanted. So that's fair. Yeah. Um, in battleship terms, it's it's a little bit all over the place. On the one hand, the British were the only ones that got to build kind of a post-treaty set of battleships with the Nelsons. Um, on the other hand, they were left with this kind of grab bag of assorted various pre-World War I designs, whereas the US got to keep the standards uh, up to the Colorados. Um, it, yeah, the battleship one is a little, is a little bit of an odd one because it's, it's slightly, I think it's slightly distorted by the fact that post uh, the London Naval Treaties, you have the modernizations of renown and three of the QEs yeah. and everything. And that kind of slightly throws out the idea of the utility of them as compared to the you know the US standards, which for the most part at the start of the war weren't modernized. Mm -hmm. And by the time they were modernized, there were so many fast battleships in existence that the kind of duties that you see, say the QEs pulling in the Mediterranean, aren't needed for the US and the Pacific, and even the West Virginia and everything just basically goes into shore bombardment duties. Well, I think in terms of the United States having to scrap 11 battleships that are under construction mm. and Great Britain has to scrap eight mm. battleships or battle cruisers that are uh, just Question. pieces of paper yeah. the, the US loses a lot more taxpayer money on stuff that's under construction yeah it, I think it's kind of it's yeah if you look at what what everyone was building and what they had to give up then yeah definitely Great Britain walked away from that the winner because they didn't have to engage in the naval race they didn't want um, but yeah at the same time I think when you, when you look at what was actually built and what was retained. It's kind of, it varies by class as to, as to who won out. Um, I think when it, when it comes to the, the follow-up naval treaties, the two London treaties, that's quite interesting because in some ways, the, the, the first London naval treaty is kind of, nobody really wins that one. It just kind of is. They're just basically closing off loopholes there. Yeah. Identified from the first lot. Um, I think from the... From second London, I mean, all the obvious winners are the guys who never signed it or just walked out. <laughs> because they're just like, yeah, we're, well, we're building our stuff. Which makes sense, because Japan, whoever we're discussing as the yeah. winner, it's not Japan. Japan yeah. loses all of these treaties, and, and so they walk out. Yeah. Um, but or then Germany's not even invited, so. No, yeah. Uh, but I, I think, I think in, the, in terms of the second London treaty, I, partly, I think, just due to timing, I think, the, at least in the terms of battleships, the US actually wins that one because they start the North Carolinas just that fraction later than the King George V. So while the King George V are locked in with 14-inch guns, the North Carolinas are able to very quickly switch over to 16s. Um, and of course, then the escalator clause comes in and the US has the industry to be able to go, actually, no, we're going to go full escalator, 16-inch, 10,000 ton extra displacement, and we're going to build the Iowas. Um, whereas even it's something that's always slightly messed with the head when you look at the kinds of the, the kind of discussions um, the escalator course. Even though it's blatantly obvious that Japan is no longer riding by the next, Italy probably never has been. <laughs> the Germans are just like, we don't care. And yet you still have the British in that environment going, yeah, but can we maybe just make the escalator course 40,000 tons? And can we not keep build, not restart building of heavy cruisers? And it's kind of, it's very much kind of denial of reality, whereas the Americans are just like, open 3D ship printing factory, press print. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, Great Britain was very much trying to do it to what is the limits of our dry docks, our industrial capacity. Yeah, and in true government fashion, they were just like, we'd like to rearm, but also we'd like to rearm cheaply if at all possible. And everyone's kind of sitting there going, that's not how a rearmament race works. Yeah, especially when it's you and your allies signing this and all the potential enemies are, are turning their nose up at it. Yeah. Uh, we are getting some questions about the current use of Pearl Harbor today. Mm -hmm. Such so, as? Is it still an active Navy base? Oh, yeah. yeah. Do we like, want to pivot? Yeah, let's pivot. 
Yes. Uh, well, yeah, it's definitely still an active Navy base. They've got enough security restrictions just to get onto the museum section. Uh, it's the first Navy museum I've been where you're just not, not period, not allowed bags. Yeah. It's basically, can you fit stuff in your pockets and not look absurd, like you're trying to smuggle half, half of the Walmart into a, into a cinema? Um, and that's about all you can bring in. Uh, obviously, they've got the Arizona Memorial in Missouri just behind both in here. Um, access to Fort Island where they are is very limited. You have to get on a bus here near the Pacific Fleet Submarine Museum um, and do all your searches and, and uh, IDs then and then get over the bridge to the island. Then you're limited to certain parts of the island where the museums are. Uh, yes, it's still an active base. In fact, there's even a couple of allied nation ships out there uh, that are still here from the Rome Pacific Nation for impact exercises that were held Unlike um, somewhere like, say, Norfolk, a lot of the stuff that's based here is submarines, and for very obvious reasons, you're not going to see a lot of them. Um, they tend to be harder to spot than, you know, a Nimitz class, and the Navy's just a little bit more sensitive about you getting close to them as well. Also worth pointing out that a lot of the stuff, like the dry docks around here, are still active and in use. In fact, that's where Missouri went into dry dock in 2009, here at the uh, Pearl Harbor Navy Yard. And Bofin's going soon. And uh, Bofin is leaving today is, what, the 12th, 13th? Uh, Bofin goes in on the 20th to dry dock. What's our next question? I would say goodbye. So, uh, Alice from New Jersey receives operating support from the New Jersey Department of State, also from a number of other businesses and private individuals like yourselves. We really appreciate your support. And uh, Jack, we appreciate your support for being on the video. Thank you. And thank you guys for watching. <laughs>